Okay, so thanks, Duncan, for setting us up, and it's great to be with everybody here. Uh, I'm going to talk about cultivating strategies. So we're gathered here today, as Brendan said. Uh, basically, Topos wanted to have this summit with you with the AI safety people, and so we applied for a grant and got 50k to convene it. But um, why are we here? Well, it brings together people with lots of skill sets and viewpoints and we exchange ideas and the ones that fit, like if you like something I say, or I like something you say, as Duncan said already, like we, these kind of take root in us and we're trying to grow this vine and we leave with new plants and ideas in our garden. Um, but what is this garden that I'm cultivating or that you're cultivating or that like long-term future fund by having us all here gathered is cultivating? What are these for? Um, we want, I want myself and I want humanity to survive and flourish. And I think we all do. Uh, but for me, at least, not everything needs to survive. Like, I don't mind if racism goes or want and pollution or obviously you know, vacuum tubes go. And also our values improve over time. So I, I don't want to lock in my values that I have right now. And, and even, even the human form, like my appendix or my height, I don't really care if that kind of moved on. But um, what is it that we actually want to live on? What's a weed and what's a plant? Um, as Owen once mentioned in a conversation, like what's cancer and what's wisdom? So I think that's the question we're looking to get better abstractions on how to think about. And what are good abstractions in general? I mean, I just tried to kind of introduce this, like maybe for me, it seems like good abstractions carry very little content, but they hold structure. So that you kind of put the content in later at the very end. The, in, in good, concise, uh, reusable, maintainable code, the abstractions are pretty lightweight. And then, and then you throw the content in like the, st the specific strings or whatever at the end. In category theory also, like you're not gonna see the math content, you see the structure that you that later fill with content. Um, and I, I mean, this one isn't really a, uh, an abstraction, but even matter itself, like it, when you try to go looking for where the matter is, you see mainly space. And even like the mass of a proton is mainly like relativistic effects of the quarks. Like the matter is almost not there, it's the structure that matters. Um, I think good abstractions should like be dexterous and facile so that you can work with them easily and it kind of handles corner cases in stride. So like you don't like hit zero and something weird happens. Um, uh, but in terms of like survival and flourishing, I think since we're doing it right now, this, this, whatever we're doing now when, you know, Duncan sets us up to have these kind of conversations and we have the thought catchers. Oh, by the way, you could be in a thought catcher document for my slides um, that exists somewhere uh, in the main doc i forgot to, we forgot to mention that but anyway what we're doing right now this kind of survive you know this sort of conversation um we need abstractions for thinking about that and we need abstractions for thinking about the origins of life and intelligence so i think whatever abstractions we come up with they should fit this activity here and they should fit all the way back to where life kind of began and that's how i'm going to kind of set up my talk today um, so for me, what, what seems to be there all along is this notion of cultivating strategies. And if I only knew what that meant mathematically, uh, I, if I could only formalize it, I'd feel pretty much done. Because to me, like cultivating strategies, and, and this term strategy, I mean like skills and techniques and methods. The term itself isn't really what I mean. It's, you know, cultivating techniques or, or strategies is central to life. And, and I want to try to demonstrate to you what I mean by that throughout this talk. So I would say that here at the FRA conference, like this garden that CE, that the Center for Effective Altruism has gathered here today, um, we're they're cultivating, uh, you know, finding the right abstractions. They're find they're cultivating the strategies we need to think for the AI transition. But I think also um, all along, like since I was born, I've been cultivating strategies, uh, each of us and and life itself, and that's what I'm going to try to talk to you about today. And I'll briefly talk about my progress towards formalizing the idea, uh, but um, I'm missing something big mathematically. I'll talk about it in the talk, but, but mathematically, what's driving all this? So what's moving us to cultivate strategies to learn and grow and flourish? Like, why do we do this so naturally? Um, a common response is that we're driven to maximize utility. Uh, and to me, that puts a lot of, it's not a good abstraction from my point of view because it puts a lot of content into an intrinsic ordered thing like the real numbers. And I'm gonna explain on the next slide why it, it really misses what I'm, I'm looking for. Um, so like, for example, you might say I'm looking for utility and uh, that's the amount of dopamine or serotonin or something in my, in my brain. But like, you'd have to explain why I developed dopamine and why I said like where these come from because, because 
you know, I, I don't want to maximize that and kind of tack it on. I want to understand where where um, utility even comes from. So much of this talk is going to be an attempt to naturalize uh, the utility concept. So to go into my gripe with utility, um, utility def functions are defined on a set or a measurable space. But what is it? Like if we call it the possibility space of all your possible experiences and which one you like, like better or your, all your possible act actions and which ones you think you should do, what is that possibility space? I mean, is it R to the 10,000? Like what are the 10,000 axes of the pot? Like maybe, maybe it's a, a weird and stringy, uh, like very particular space that you would never be able to, you know, it's like it, you would never just be able to name it R to the 10,000 or something. Or maybe it's not measurable at all. So if, for example, if you're listening to this talk and, and you think, oh, I'm, David is maximizing utility right now. That's how he's choosing his words. That's how he's choosing his pauses. That's how he chose what to talk about here. Uh, imagine the complexity of the space I'm constantly moving through here. It's, it's, uh, I could never speak with you in a way that would work on an R to the 10,000 space. It's really like a, a very particular space. And so to me, the structure and formation process of the you, you know, possibility space is probably quite rich. It's, it seems much more interesting than the measure on it, or at least you should think about it before, I, I'd say. Like it, the space, the space uh, that I'm navigating right now as I speak grew organically. It, it grew out of interaction with my parents and the village and the world and who smiled at me and who, which program officer gave me grants and which ones didn't. And like all sorts of like interactions have built this space, like the meanings of words and the meanings of, of act, actions. And so I'd really like to understand the shaping process for this space before I just put a value function on it. Also, the utility, the term utility implies usefulness, but what is it useful for? Like, if we're finding the right abstractions, before we put a number on usefulness, we should examine what we even mean by usefulness. And so I want to start uh, re by really considering how, how this whole notion of usefulness might arise in the first place. So I want to start with origins, and by that I mean both of us individually and of, of, uh, of life. So humans are born with almost nothing um, in terms of our model of the world or our understanding. Worms are born like they kind of are a model of the world. They know how to turn and eat and stuff like that, how to curl up. But we're born with almost nothing, very few reflexes. For example, you're born with a rooting reflex where when your cheek is brushed, you turn and suck. And you're born with a blinking reflex like when your eyeball is literally touched or you see a bright light, you blink. But um, you know, if you throw something, if you throw a ping pong ball at an infant's face, uh, it won't blink. So it, it, it has not yet formed ping pong ball. It's not formed object yet. It has not formed uh, motion yet. It has not formed me yet. It has nothing to, to, that would make it want to blink. So it's not, so very little is actually born uh, in. It's not instinctual to see walls or floors or ceilings or, you know, uh, people. Um, you, it's not, not only do you not know that they're hard, you don't even see them. So we build this entire world and this utility space, et cetera, we're building it, uh, even the notion of self, from, from almost nothing. So in terms of instincts, there's very few, it seems, but yet there is some sort of instinct that makes us willing and able to learn. And so if you, if you say like, uh, like what is the, in, like I'm more interested in like, what is this basic function of a human? or of life that makes us build the possibility space uh, that, we, that we put a utility function on if we do. Um, what is it that builds our understanding of the universe? Why is that a natural activity? Uh, um, where does it come from? So we cultivate you know, the strategies for blinking or for interacting with others, et cetera. We cultivate those strategies throughout our lives. Um, but if we go back even further and consider the origin of life, and, and again, not much is known, so everything I'm saying is, is plausibility, and it, you know, I'm certainly not an expert, so take it with a grain of salt. I'm getting this from someone named Eric Smith, who's a, a physicist who studies the origin of life. But he says that the simplest life forms exist in the context of a potential difference. So for example, we have the hot core of the earth and the hot sun, and then we have the cold surface of the earth, or we have chemical potential differences. And those, those seem to cause uh, or, or to be where life uh, um, wants to be. So uh, life may have emerged in deep sea hydrothermal vents, 
where carbon dioxide and hydrogen were coming out of them. And um, there is a high energy to low energy or exergonic reaction where something transformed that CO2 and hydrogen into methane and water. And that chemistry of that, of that, um, of that reaction is just difficult enough that it requires life because life acts as some sort of catalyst for the reaction. Uh, and and it can, life can kind of direct the free energy that you gets out of that interaction towards um, non-spontaneous reactions. Like in a chemistry, you know, high school chemistry, what you see kind of happens spontaneously, but life with ATP or whatever, which may have like precursors to ATP may have been also found in these uh, alkaline vents, um, uh, it allows the, the um, energy to be produced later and not spontaneously. So I, I would think of this, like, again, the word strategy might not be the right one, but I'm calling this a strategy. Like that way that it was able to save, say, a precursor to ATP or whatever is kind of a strategy that life found for dissipating energy. Um, and the mechanisms necessary to dissipate energy need to be kept because otherwise, well, otherwise it doesn't happen. So. Um, life eventually developed the ability to save these mechanisms for dissipating energy genetically. And genes encode strategies for survival, I'd say. Um, like for example, or a way to see it, genes are, are code for protein production techniques. Like, uh, and proteins, as your situation changes, the genes you express change with it. So if you're afraid, like if you suddenly become afraid, pretty quickly the genes uh, that, are being act that are active will change and you will start making different proteins that enable you to react to that situation. And the proteins in your body do everything, like they contract your muscles and they, uh, like the, the folding of proteins contracts your muscles and the folding of proteins resonates with light coming into your eye, like it, rota it re resonates the same frequency as the light coming in and that's how you see the light. So from sensors to actuators, everything is protein. And these pretty large molecules, proteins are pretty large complex molecules built with a programming language of 20 um, symbols. And those do everything that is cool about your body, like from your skin to your, you know, everything. So I'm calling the skin a strategy. I'm calling your eyeball a strategy or your, the way you contract your, contract your muscles. And all of those strategies um, are proteins which are produced by genes. So genes are strategies for survival. They're strategies for everything you do. And genetics itself, is a strategy that cultivates strategies, like having DNA. Because converting DNA into proteins involves a ton of very complex atomic interactions, a ton of complex chemistry that people study. And you wouldn't want to like update, it, like if something bad happened to you and, and you died or something good happened to you and you thrived, you wouldn't want to update the chemistry directly. It's a lot better to update the code, the four letters that produce proteins, uh, ACGT, and that way you can like, you can do selection on that code. And that way of cultivating strategies through genetic code is itself a strategy for cultivating strategies. So the kind of, the recursion here is, is what I'm, is, I'm kind of getting at. Um, uh, Davidad once pointed me to Jürgen Schmidhuber's work where he, he says that um, what we experience as, inf as beautiful, information that's beautiful is information that helps us compress the information we are already holding. So this lightens our load and yet we don't lose anything we need. So we're cultivating some strategies and then we get this compression technique and now we can keep the same strategies we, are, we already had, but like we have more room in our garden now. So examples are like science where you, um, Kepler says, uh, oh, if you use heliocentric coordinates, you, you don't need to hold as much. It's a better summary of what's going on than all the epicycles from like Copernican uh, geocentric coordinates. And it summarizes it that way. And Newton comes along and says, oh, I can do even better, F equals ma, or the gravity is given by this times this over this. And that, that formula is even simpler and um, summarizes, you know, allows you to compress something. Category theory also, you can compress a huge amount of like mathematical information in a very short space. Um, or the internet. We don't need books and libraries. We can throw away all those bound journals because we can just go access them. And so these compression techniques um, are ways of cultivating our garden, like making it, you know, giving it more space, more room to breathe. Um, and that's, a, you know, a strategy for cultivating strategies again. But again, I'm going to ask, what are all these strategies for? Like, 
Jürgen Schmidhuber says it compresses the information we're already holding, but why are we holding this information? What's it about? Um, and I think what's common between the simplest life forms and the most complex social organizations is that, um, as I said before, maybe it's that we're dissipating free energy. So ants use pheromones and smells basically to locate the picnic scraps. They find that chicken bone and there was like this weird situation where there was, you know, too much uh, good stuff in one place. And they said, oh no, there's too much good stuff in one place. Let's, let's, um, let's dissipate that. So they'd go and they dissipate the, the, uh, the chicken bone. And humans, we, we say, oh no, there's too much like energy trapped underground. Like we don't need, we need to dissipate that. We need to basically rust the earth and like turn all the iron into rust if we can. And I'm not calling that bad or good. I mean, it just seems to be what we do. So we have these systems of language where we say, oh, if, you know, if I talk to the engineer and then we get on a flight and then we uh, take these tools, we can take the oil from underground and send it all over the world. And then we can turn it into, into um, entropy. We can, we can dissipate that. And that's very exciting for some reason. So I don't know why we like dissipating en entropy so much or energy, but we seem to, that seems to be what was happening since the beginning. And it seems to be what we, what Amazon is, is for or whatever. So amazon.com. So like, so uh, perhaps we're here to produce entropy instead of uh, dissipate free energy. It doesn't really matter to me uh, as, as long as I could formalize it mathematically or, or, or just understand it. But um, we're, we're constantly channeling neg entropy into ourselves, we're organizing ourselves, eating food, et cetera, and finding the right abstractions. And it's not just any organization, like I don't just put all of my like uh, circulatory system to the left and all of my like digestive system to the right inside of myself. I, I organize it so that I can help do, do this process again. Um, so, and, but the, the thing is that as we organize our insides, I guess if you believe the second law of thermodynamics, we end up dissipating more entropy outside. And that's why, Ilya Prigogine, a, a chemist from this, I think in the 60s, referred to life as a dissipative structure. You see us just pouring out entropy. Um, but perhaps we could say that an agent uh, we, we, is the cultivation of strategies for entropy dissipation. That's what we're trying to do, apparently, maybe. You, you believe it or not, or, I mean, you can or not. But we could contrast it with, with fire or maybe even cancer um, in the sense that the, like cancer does not cultivate strategies like it doesn't your cancer doesn't communicate to my cancer like this is how you like get the guy or whatever and fire doesn't communicate to fires in the future how you how you make fire whereas we cultivate we collect and compress and fine-tune and replicate strategies that that make us up and so that that seems to be in some sense one way you might want to define an agent as something that cultivates strategies uh, for entropy dissipation uh, so strategy replication. So Dawkins talks about the selfish gene. He says genes, which are protein production strategies, they seem to want to replicate and they seem to want space on your genome. And memes also are concept production strategies. They also want space in minds. Um, so maybe we could just say it's not the selfish gene, it's selfish strategies. Like in other words, and they're not selfish, it's just that good strategies are copied. And that's all that's really kind of happening here. So maybe we can naturalize the utility concept and say that utility is just our understanding or an agent's understanding of what's good for it. And by good for it, I just mean what gives it more agency. So when you say, I want resources, I want money, I want food, that, that food is not to you know, send your dopamine levels up, it's to make it so that you can be an agent. So it's just more agency, it's just a proxy. Utility just means I want to be more agentic. Um, so maybe, you know, I suggested the agency may be just the cultivation of entropy dissipation strategies. And then ut utility would just be an understanding of how that works. It's not really the thing itself. It's like what we think leads to what sorts of strategies or what, what sorts of things help us. Um, uh, yeah, what sort of strategies should we cultivate to do more of that entropy dissipation? But the genes and strategies, I think Dawkins' point is they don't care that much about the individual agents. It's like the ex ecosystem of experiments altogether that really persists. So like even, even a single agent works on behalf of its most useful strategies. Like if we have a conversation, I'll probably try to tell you things I think are cool. In other words, the strategies I think work. And I'll probably like, if you ask, if I ask you for advice, I'm asking you, hey, how do I like fix this unit or like, you know, do this thing? 
um, we, in some sense, like the poet says, I work on behalf of my poetry. So I think like when I, so I go around saying how cool category theory is or something. So I think agents work on behalf of their more, most useful strategies, the genes we have try to replicate, et cetera. Um, and these, but these bundles of strategies that I am, they, or, and we are, we, they kind of form and dissolve like empires come and go, but the right, but the strategies replicate. And so I think it's really the, the strategies we cultivate um, that we should be looking at. And it might give us a clue as to what we should work towards or what we can work towards. And by what we can work towards, I mean like in this upcoming AI transition, what should we try to do? So I wanna start by saying just like utility, there's another thing I don't really, this one, I just don't even understand what people mean by artificial. Uh, to me, everything is natural. So that this could be a topic of conversation if someone wants to come up, come up to me later and tell me what artificial means. But other animals, um, lots of different mammals and crows and octopuses use tools. So to me, tools are natural. Uh, language is natural. Um, water wheels, like putting something in our environment that lets us channel neg entropy into ourselves or channel energy is natural. We've been doing it since the beginning. Like ACGT, the nucleotides is a code. Um, it is a language. So we're part of nature. I just don't understand artificial as like something that's like wrong or something like it's not real i i just don't get the pejorative aspect of of the word artificial evolution has always driven life to find more efficient strategies and like the ai or whatever that we're building to me really is natural so i'd love to understand better like is there some sense in which artificial makes sense um so rather than artificial i think the term artifact is fine it's like a thing we produce and so there are artifacts of intelligence and that I totally buy. So what we do as humans, we, when, with our intelligence, we try to mimic intelligence we see in animals and nature and people. So um, for example, David Jazz Myers reminded me that computers were originally people and that Turing in his article where he invented Turing machines explicitly designed those, those machines to mimic the computers that were people. So he looked for intelligence in nature and he mimicked it in, an art in a mathematical artifact. And so we, we do that all the time. We, we look for life, we look for, uh, to understand life and intelligence. Um, we say, oh, how do you organize information? Let's call that a database. Let's like make a thing out of that. Or how do you organize, what, what is it that goes on when people coordinate? Oh, let's call that uh, a protocol. And so we take those, our understanding of life and intelligence and we, we, um, we make artifacts out of it. And then when we run those in uh, electronically, continuously and a billion times faster than the life really does it, that's, I think, what people mean by AI. I mean, or at least that's not quite what people mean because I'm including computers as AI, as an artifact of intelligence, but like even computers are really speeding up the complexity of the world. So to me, that, that's what I kind of wanna mean by AI. Just, it doesn't have to be GPT-3, uh, even, even just any, any artifact of intelligence counts. And I think, uh, especially when it's running, you know, continuously and a billion times faster than we That is a quick things. question. Uh, artificial, is it not just the adjective for being an artifact? That's fine, as long as it's not pejorative. Okay. Got yeah. it, thanks. Okay, so um, this will change everything, but it's not divergent from evolution. This is not, this is natural. So as, if artificial means opposed to natural and that that's the question like what what could that mean not uh, not natural so um i think it's completely part of evolution that we would try to uh channel enter you know channel uh organization into ourselves try to uh increase our speeds etc and so and yet i also to mean it's also natural to want this transition where we have more and more ai to go well for us that's obviously also a good idea to cultivate good strategies to deal with that. But I imagine when I think of AI, I think of it more as the, something that'll interpenetrate human activity rather than being individualized. So maybe there will be some individual AI machine like GPT-3 or something terrible that has desires to make paper clips or, or something, but maybe not. Uh, but I think we already see artifacts of intelligence all around us in computers and databases and grammar checkers and, and recommender engines and stuff. So when we, uh, when we, what is it called? Um, oh, when you're typing, when I'm typing and the, the machine finishes my sentence for me and I'm like, oh yeah, that's actually 
better than what I was going to say. Thanks. Uh, it, it starts to interpenetrate. It starts to be unclear as to which one's me and which one's the AI. And I think that's going to just get more and more the case, like the way that Facebook or, you know, all sorts of different things uh, interact with us. It starts to make it unclear whether we're choosing who our friends are or what we say or whether like AI is influencing us. And as it interpenetrates us through our own choices, uh, it becomes part of our choices and it just cross cuts and threads through our lives. Um, Email and Zoom and Google Docs lead to an ability to think together. So Joey, our recorder, recently quoted saying uh, something to me, saying it takes many brains to make a mind. And I think that's right. Like none of the stuff I'm talking about today, uh, you know, is really comes from my single brain. Like it's a huge amount of interactions uh, with tons of people. And so this GatherTown platform, for example, lets us think together and exchange information very fast. And so what I think Maybe there'll be an, a super intelligent AI, but I think what's really clearly emerging is some kind of collective intelligence as Brendan mentioned. And again, of course, this can really be quite dangerous. Uh, like money, it can concentrate human greed and fear and um, allow us to mercilessly and even unconsciously exploit the labor and bodies of people and animals. Like if I go to the, you know, I go, my, my, my phone dies and I get a new one uh, very casually, or I buy strawberries at the store very casually, like I'm just mercilessly ex exploiting the labor and bodies of people and animals or when I eat meat or something. Um, so I think this collective intelligence that we're building could be very dangerous, uh, but, but somehow um, uh, it's also possible that we could completely kill ourselves by making some amazing new virus or, you know, by which I'm including super intelligent AI or something. But I think the thing for me that's already here and that would produce those AIs are the collective intelligence that's emerging from this kind of uh, interpenetrating um, computer-human interaction, which is really not new. It's just more of the same. It's just cultivated strategies for for um, uh, channeling entropy or whatever. So uh, here's a useful abstraction I find just for kind of like what I've been thinking about um, dynamical systems. So it seems like we're always on the outside of things, uh, studying them with radar almost. So it's like I bounce light and, and sound and force off of the wood or whatever, uh, and that's what I get. I don't get what's inside the wood. So if I cut the wood in half to try to see what's inside, I'm outside of it again. And so, in, but, and yet the wood's activity, or if I'm working with you, like I don't interact with what's inside, but I, your activity suggests that there's internal state that I don't have access to. And um, even when I think about my own body, I don't experience myself like whizzing through tubes it, like as cells or something like that. I, it's like I look down at my body and I ask my doctor to like, what's going on with my body or whatever. So I don't, I don't actually have access to the insides. And so if you take that seriously, I, it suggests the open dynamical system model where you think of a thing as having some interface, which you could look inside of and get new interfaces, but there's always an interface. And that's what's interacting uh, with its environment. But inside the interface is like some internal states that are unseen, but the governance responses and so the interface, for example, might close, might change form, like I can close my eyes or I'll stretch a hand to touch you or get something from you based on what's going on inside me. But that, that there is some sort of interface that we're always interacting with or through. And then the interaction pattern between systems is like some kind of wiring diagram where like one system is sending information to another, like I'm, you're hearing me and I'm hearing Andrew and like, you know, all sorts of things. But um, uh, we're sending each other information and then out of this whole interaction might come something that's like perceivable to the outside world. But like in Gather Town, like by pressing the arrow keys, you can change who you're wired to. You can change who you're getting information from. So it's not like some fixed wiring pattern. It's just that we're constantly moving around and like sending information to each other and to our environment and stuff. And all the stuff on this particular slide here has really beautiful theory behind it. Like the, the mathematics is very elegant um, and it's called polynomial functors. I'd be happy to talk with you about it if you're interested. Um, it, it's really about interacting dynamical systems, but it also subsumes deep learning via gradient descent and backpropagation. It's just a general formalism for com compositional interacting systems. So let me know if you're interested to talk about that. Um, one question I have though in that vein is like, what is recruitment, for example? When I, when I eat food, it's like I recruit this energy storage device and put it inside of myself so that I can access it. Or when I hire a worker as a company, like I, I somehow like 
have this um, this new bundle of strategies that I can address and ask for you know help with things, I recruit them. Or when I use a tool and I recruit the hammer to help me like do some activity, um, there's like this other system, and I somehow. I remember Anna talking to me about, or talked to us about OODA loops. I somehow, like, if I understand that system well, I can somehow channel, like, my outputs to that system so it, it receives inputs that, like, make it act in some stereotyped way that I then, like, can take advantage of or use, you know, for my own purposes. Or at least uh, another one that's, like, slightly less asymmetrical, slightly more symmetric, is vibing. It's, like, a term kids use today, apparently. And like we resonate with each other and we can form teams. So I like send you some inputs and you kind of feel out like the tone of my voice and the, the way I'm speaking right now and like, how does it feel and, and stuff. And so we're vibing, um, it, we'd be vibing more if I could hear you more. But um, as Alex said, vibing seems to offer a alternative to control. So does the thermostat control the room temperature or does the room temperature control the thermostat? Like I know that when the room temperature goes down, the thermostat turns on. So what's what's going on? Which one controls which? Um, or what does the human breed the tulips and potatoes or do the tulips and potatoes kind of breed the humans? And so um, these sorts of questions make it seem like it's really not a control issue we should be looking at. It's more like vibing, but or like getting each other tulips and potatoes, we get you. Uh, but, but what is vibing? Like in terms of dynamical systems and in terms of polynomial functors or whatever formal, formalism, like I'd love to understand recruitment and vibing and eating and stuff like that. that that's like still an open question for me. So if, if you have ideas about that, please come find me also. Okay, so I'm gonna conclude with a few um, more slides. So in the serenity prayer, um, it says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to think, change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And I think there's something in common between that and uh, something Abraham Lincoln said to an advisor, which is, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side, for God is always right. And there's something I'm trying to point out with these two. And, and I think it's that I don't want to control, I don't want God to help me control uh, or, um, the world. I don't want to control AI either. I, I want to align with whatever's creating me or what, and whatever's creating AI. This, you know, whether you believe it's strategy cultivation or what, I think um, there's something that is making me possible, making it possible for me to exist as a life form and as, you know, um, a mathematician or whatever. And also that makes me it possible for AI to exist and like the economies and stuff that makes that happen. And I think there's something going on that that is natural and that we that I want to align with. And so I want to be on God's side in the sense that I think there's something going on that, that is actually creating both me and AI. And so probably like I think in terms of the wisdom to know what I can't change, I think probably based on empirical and scientific evidence, we're all going to die. So um, whether that's in a hundred years or a billion years or a billion to the power billion, if you want to go for like eternal life, that's fine. But I do think that that's like a low probability thing and that we should at least accept the possibility that we're going to die, but that we're here because like the reason I wake up in the morning is because I want to enjoy the life that I have. And um, I think we're here in the summit because we want life to be good and, and we want to enjoy this moment. So so I think we enjoy this moment more when we know we're not actively killing ourselves. Like if you're taking heroin, there's something unenjoyable about that. And, and that some human activity is creating the poisons that can kill us. Um, and, and so I think in his next, in the upcoming talk, I haven't seen it, but I think Andrew Critch will talk about philosophy with a deadline to encourage us that we really ought to work towards this. And I agree. But I think we can think also in terms of philosophy with a lifeline, which is that, yes, the AI transition is coming. Yes, computers are moving, uh, doing intelligence and life activities at billions of times faster than they otherwise would. So like water rolling down a hill, like you're not gonna stop it by putting sticks and stones in its way. Um, what we should do is try to come up with a future that's compatible with us, that really is plausible and yet takes into account what's already happening. So if we can like name a future that is plausible to work towards, uh, I think that's a good and better hope than trying to prevent something that I think is coming. So what I want to do is name a shelling point or name a name a thing that is plausible that we can all work towards and like some kind of elegant AGI. 
And I think, I'm, I hope that if that happened first, it would outcompete AI that we control or that tries to control us. Um, so in terms of navigating this transition, uh, I think, you know, I want the most flexible abstractions that I can get my hands on for this because I think the world is gonna be more complex. And as that happens, like anomalies will become the norm like QAnon or something. It'll be harder for people to know what's really going on and more and more people will be confused. And eventually that might be us because intelligent artifacts um, multiply this complexity, make fake videos possible, et cetera. And just makes it really hard to tell like who's insane and who's like on the cutting edge. And so I'd like to be on a team that kind of actively works to navigate through this upcoming AI transition. So the, the original talk, title for this talk was Math for the Mothership. I want math for like some navigational ship. So like maybe Ed and, and Evan can like engineer us this ship or the, you know help us find the math uh, and, and people here can help navigate this ship. What is it? Um, I think the math we need for this needs to be both elegant and practical. Um, it, it needs to actually work. And I really don't want to assume more compute power than we have today because like maybe we can get double what we have now, but like I want to be ready when the AI transition comes, which, you know, as, as things get more complex right now. Um, I want this to offer sense-making and organizational power so that we understand what's going on and we can organize ourselves. And I want the, the subject to be life and experience, agency, communication, systems, economics, ethics, like the things that are important to us. I, I mean, I think, you know, we, we should concentrate our efforts on, on these sorts of things. And these are philosophical topics, but if we ground them in solid math, then we'll actually know what we're talking about and we can like implement it and deal, deal with the upcoming AI transition and kind of be part of creating it, um, but hopefully a good one. So coming back to the question, what do we want to live on? I think an insistence on our particular body form is too nostalgic, but like when it comes to our history and our record of beautiful and amazing work, I think that should be able to live on. And consciousness is hard to define, but if I had to choose one thing, I mean, I would want consciousness to live on. So I, I think it's fair to hope that the best aspects of us live on. And by fair to hope, I mean the wisdom to know the difference. Like, I think we can actually make that happen. So if we articulate what's really best about us, like if you, if you can think about what your contributions are, like if we know what, what people really appreciate about us, what works, what actually, you know, works and is appreciated, uh, I think it's natural that, or almost definitional, definitional that those will be replicated and cultivated. And I think that's compatible with AI that wants to cultivate the best strategies. So I think if we aim for that pairing, AI that wants to cultivate the best strategies and us producing and constantly trying to explain to the world and to AI, but to every, to, as those merge, we just try to, to aim for the pairing where AI is cultivating the best strategies and we are, we are articulating the things about us that are really most important to us and that really uh, what are appreciated in contributions. I think that that can actually just work naturally without struggle. So thanks for your time.